Hello, my name is Tom Buley, and I'd like to talk about the COVID project that I worked on together with Ricardo. Uh, we call the project Berets. To summarize it in just a couple of slides, here's the Raspberry Pi. Uh, has an install base out there of about 40 million units. These things are remarkably fast and good for robotics applications, but the challenge is we are always stuck reinventing the wheel of how we do the voltage regulation from our LiPo batteries to the standard 12 volts, 5 volts, 3.3 volts that you need to, to put the whole system together. We need to uh, have H bridges to drive our DC motors, set up brushless motor drivers, we need to communicate with sensors, we need to have an IMU integrated, and that can really get in the way of getting fast progress, uh, a new robotic system that we want to develop, either in the educational setting or in the product development setting. And so our answer to this conundrum is to build the ultimate hat for the Raspberry Pi, which we call the Raspberry Beret. This has a lot of that functionality that we need in many robots and has a little prototyping area that anything that we didn't include, you can add on. Here's some of the functionality for the Raspberry Beret, which has um, encoder connectors. It has um, two very capable H-bridge systems to, uh, to drive several motors, um, has all of our voltage regulation circuitry, um, servo headers for driving servos and ESCs, a little microcontroller to coordinate everything and has CAN and RS-45 transceivers, balance connectors to check the charge in your battery, USB connector for programming, etc. But we also wanted to have a degree of platform portability. And so if you start off a project on one single board computer and you decide that you want to upgrade to a cell phone grade single board computer like those currently available from Qualcomm and others in the uh, 96 boards format, uh, then we wanted to provide a standardized low-level interface to all of the sensors and actuators and, and power uh, sources in, in the system. Um, and so um, we're developing a family of berets. Um, and so we can add the black beret to the 96 boards CE family um, and uh, has the um, same sort of uh, functionality. The Beret family is currently a family of six uh, motor control boards that are compact, powerful, efficient, and easily extended. Uh, they can operate either as carrier boards to the popular single board computers available today or standalone. Um, and again, their primary functions um, are to regulate power from 2S to 6S LiPos, um, so up to 28 volts um, at uh, up to 20 amps, uh, and uh, for feedback control of nominally up to eight um, brushless DC motors and one amps each, um, and a whole lot of other things. Um, the goal is to simplify and accelerate the development of feedback controllers for mechatronic systems. Um, and the designs are open design hardware and open source software, um, which uh, uh, readily facilitates people modifying uh, these designs to make their own uh, target applications. Uh, potential applications run the gamut. Um, in uh, mobile robotics, industrial automation, uh, drones, precision agriculture, et cetera. It's a uh, platform portable carrier board family, which again allows you to port high level code from one Linux single board computer to the other. So as the algorithmic demands increase for vision processing, or as the single board computers just get faster and you wanna upgrade, um, you can do that while keeping the same low level interface or in standalone mode, um, you can integrate the single board computer all together. There's a little um, STM32 G4 on here, uh, which runs a ARM Cortex M4 with an FPU, um, with, uh, which is quite capable of to uh, coordinate many low level tasks. And that helps you to reduce system cost for high volume production. Um, and so the capabilities of the boards that we're looking at again are primarily focused on power regulation and feedback control. So there are encoder counters, there's drivers for um, brushed DC motors, H bridges, um, web steppers. There's also some PWM generation across the standard headers uh, to drive servos and ESCs. Um, and you can put little expansion boards we call beret shields um, on these little Arduino-like headers up in this quadrant up here um, in order to, uh, to, to drive brushless uh, DC motors, et cetera. Um, so there's a standard suite of sensors, IMU, barometer, magnetometer. Um, <clears throat> has a little analog system, two ADCs and DACs with uh, adjustable voltages and adjustable filtering. Um, there's CAN and RS-45 transceivers on board. And uh, you can extend uh, with a variety of other functions on a, a standard platform that we have set up here. Um, so there are um, six variants of the boards. So I've already introduced the, uh, the Raspberry Beret, which is a full featured Raspberry Pi hat. Um, we also have a reduced version of it that we'll make available at low cost, which is 
same PCB, so that helps us to save some money, um, and uh, just partially populated. Um, we have a uh, version that fits the uh, Qualcomm RB5 and other boards in the um, 96 boards CE format. Um, and we have uh, also a version of, under development to fit the BeagleBone Black and AI. Um, and uh, then we are also making two standalone versions. So if you're connecting um, a uh, controller in a house to the barn or the chicken coop, um, you uh, would probably want to communicate over a twisted pair using RS-45. Uh, if you're developing a smart car type application where you're worried about uh, noisy uh, voltage situation, you should probably want to use CAN. The, the Green Beret doesn't even have any H bridges, but the H bridges that you want to uh, incorporate uh, need to be put on top of the shields. The Blue Beret uh, makes a little space, gets rid of CAN on RS-45, allowing you to put in at least one H bridge uh, and uh, so we can drive a few motors out of that. And so we have a range of boards here that have different numbers of motor drivers, H bridges, uh, encoder counters, um, and pinouts for servos and ESCs. Some of them support CAN and RS-45. Several of them are full size. Again, we have two designed for the uh, Raspberry Pis, uh, one designed for 96 board CE format, such as the Qualcomm RB5, um, one designed for the uh, BeagleBone um, Altoids 10 uh, form factor, uh, and two that are a little bit smaller, um, that are designed for standalone applications. Um, so as just one slide of background of how we're coming into this project, we played a key role in working together with Jason Kridner and the team uh, at BeagleBoard to develop the BeagleBone Blue. Um, and we learned a lot of valuable lessons along the way. Um, first of all, um, surface mount JSTs break off the PCB pretty, pretty easily. You really need pin through hole JSTs to connect out to other things. Uh, single board computers get faster every year, so the march of progress is relentless. Uh, and so if you want to build a board that will stand the test of time, you really need to decouple the single board computer from the power regulation, motor control um, functionality. And so that's what we're trying to do with the Bray project. Um, there's a large range of wireless standards, um, so Wi-Fi, Bluetooth modules, and there's also uh, LoRa and Zigbee and, and all sorts of other radio standards. Um, and Different applications are going to want different wireless standards, um, and it's important to allow the user to select what they want. So really, wireless should be something that can be added on a separate module tight to the system, uh, but the user should be able to have some flexibility on their choice of what wireless standards they want to incorporate. 2S LiPos are insufficient for many applications of interest and want 4S or 6S. The IMU uh, needs to be uh, tightly coupled to the microcontroller that's running a real-time operating system to provide near real-time feedback. We want to use mobile inverted pendulums to get students started in embedded control. Uh, we developed this, uh, this kit that we called EDUMIP, um, and that was um, a, a big hit when we introduced it. Um, we're currently working on version two of that that will support the Bray family of boards, uh, and it's actually going into production quite soon, so stay tuned for that. Um, so I'd like to give a brief technical overview of, uh, of some key features. Um, again, power regulation. Um, we have an XT30 connector at up to 15 amps continuous, 20 amps peak. We think this board is going to be able to handle. Um, and there's a MOSFET that uh, protects the board and can shut the LiPo power off to the board and turn it back on. Um, there's a, uh, a switching regulator to develop uh, VS1, which is somewhere in the range of 3.3 to 12 volts. Um, at up to six amps, which is used to drive the servos and the SCs. Um, we have a uh, regulator to develop BMB, which is only five volts to uh, drive the um, um, motherboard. Um, and uh, we have a 3.3 volt regulator to drive all the circuits on this board and the sensors that you might connect up. Um, and we also have uh, one more power op amp um, to, uh, to provide an intermediate voltage somewhere between zero and 3.3 volts uh, that can either source or sync um, up to 400 milliamps. And that can act as a reference ground when developing an analog system that operates between zero and 3.3 volts. Um, we use this op amp to, uh, to provide a voltage right in the middle to provide the, the, the ground signal for that. Um, so, um, this setup that I just described is used on the uh, three boards that have five volt motherboards. The uh, fourth board, the Black Beret, drives a motherboard which needs around a 12 volt input to drive the board and communicates to all of its peripherals at only 1.8 volts. And so some extra circuitry is going to be needed for our Beret um, in order to do the uh, appropriate voltage shifting. Uh, and so the 96 boards board can communicate with 
common sensors uh, and uh, peripheral devices that you might want to hook up to today, which are normally either 3.3 or 5 volts. For the 96 boards boards that we, we might hook up, we need to have uh, at least a 4S LiPo uh, to bring power on the board. And also the uh, 96 boards uh, CE format board will generate 5 volts that we can then uh, take back up to uh, the beret and use. So uh, the black beret will not generate 5 volts itself. Um, so VN powers the motor drivers directly. Um, we uh, generate a VS1 signal, which powers um, the five uh, servos or ASCs that you might hook up uh, to signal header B. Um, and you can power signal header A with either um, VS1 again or VN directly. Um, and there's a uh, 12 amp shunt connector, which allows you to, uh, to bring a lot of power um, uh, out over those uh, uh, servo header pins. VMB, of course, powers the attached motherboard through the motherboard header. The 3.3 and 5 volt lines that we develop power the logic circuits on the Bray, the JSTs, um, and the digital and analog headers, and all of the digital outputs from uh, like the encoder connectors, what have you, are 3.3 volts TTL and 5 volt tolerant. And so we can communicate with components that prefer either 3.3 or 5 volts. The stack up uh, was designed very carefully. It's an eight layer PCB um, with a careful trade off here, sufficiently thin layer thicknesses to allow you um, the fine features necessary to break out a uh, eight millimeter pitch ball grid array. Um, and at the same time, the layers need to be sufficiently thick that on other sections of the board, we can handle high current where necessary. And so we actually use different thicknesses of copper on different layers based on their functions. And some layers that are carrying high power are stitched. Um, and for uh, electromagnetic interference and signal integrity considerations, um, we of course put power and ground planes next to each high-speed signal trace, um, use curved traces with no sharp corners, match signal links, um, uh, et, et cetera, power ground isolated from signal ground. Um, and to, uh, to, to look at the overall layout of the board, it's convenient to think in terms of quadrants. We have a logic sensor and expansion quadrant up here. Um, we have a connector quadrant that's sp split between the Northwest and the Southeast. We have a power quadrant down in the Southwest and we have a motor quadrant just uh, north of the power quadrant. We can think about how we're moving power around um, and the um, high current traces are very short and very fat and in some cases stitched between multiple layers. Um, and so VN is traveling up here on multiple layers and VS1 is traveling this direction on multiple layers. The microcontroller again is an STM32G4, 100 pin version of that with 512 kilobytes of flash. Um, these are its uh, specs, a lot of uh, supplemental units, which are useful in feedback control situations. We use that the functionality on that uh, particular MCU very, very thoroughly, um, and so much so that we have very few extra pins on it after we're done with it to use as GPIOs to drive random functions. Uh, and so we add another GPIO expander to give us 24 more GPIOs to drive uh, various other uh, flags that we need across the board. All of these dedicated hardware subsystems on the MCU are driving various things on our board without loading the uh, main ARM core. Here's our connectivity chart. Um, the MCU in the middle and all of these green things are hardware subsystems that are around the ARM Cortex M4. Um, and so to communicate over PWNs to, uh, to, to drive your servo headers or to, to count the clicks of encoders coming and turning, all of that is handled uh, by these dedicated uh, hardware subunits, communication over um, SPI or UART, et cetera. They're all handled by this extra stuff and leaving the ARM core to do the more involved calculations. One of the big things that you need some bandwidth for the ARM core to, to do is to actually calculate this situational awareness. So to fuse together the inputs that you're getting from the IMU, the magnetometer, and the barometer together with additional inputs that you're getting from the wheel encoders and uh, GPS unit in order to estimate the uh, evolving dynamics of the system. Uh, and so since all these other features are offloaded, uh, you can do that sensor fusion on the ARM core itself. The software library runs the robot control library developed by James Strausson, who was a former student in our lab here. And uh, we got a uh, tight integration with MathWorks on that. And so we're going to try to stay consistent with that containerized environment that we can still connect to some of those advanced features. Of course, we're going to have a 
a ROS interface uh, for low-level functions. And the idea is that by doing all of the low-level feedback on the MCU on this carrier board, it frees up the high-level tasks to be uh, calculated on the attached Linux-based computer. Okay, so um, it's a very dense board. Um, the high-density integration is achieved by a variety of techniques. One is via impad. For instance, there is a component that sits here. Um, but instead of having to put the pad for the component and then a little wire out to a via to take the signal to route it out somewhere else, we put the via uh, directly underneath it. That's a uh, modern uh, PCB fabrication technique that really allows you to get things much denser. Um, and it's actually not that expensive at most fab houses compared to blind and buried views um, examples are here. Those have been around for quite some time, but are very expensive because it requires a separate drill step for each of the layers of the PCB before it's sandwiched together, which gets mighty expensive. So we have no blind or buried vias anywhere on our board. All of our holes uh, go all the way through the board. And so that saves some step in, in manufacturing, but we can still get quite dense with our layout because we're using via and pad technology. It's an eight layer board, like I said, in order to be traffic cop. Um, some layers are primarily slated for north-south communication, the east-west direction on other layers. And of course, we uh, do link matching on uh, uh, traces corresponding to uh, high-speed uh, signals as indicated by the uh, uh, extra um, squiggles of the purple lines here. So on each layer, uh, the links of these traces match. What's particularly uh, impressive from the components uh, that we selected are the DRV 8912Q1 um, motor drivers from, from TI. These are relatively new. We uh, use a pair of those. Each of them has 12 half bridges and each of them generates um, up to four PWMs. There's a fast SPI connection to the microcontroller. So microcontroller just tells it the speeds that it wants the various motors to go uh, over SPI and then the DRV um, generates uh, the PWMs in order to make that happen. Um, and so it allows us nominally simultaneous independent bidirectional control of eight brushed DC motors, but there's quite a bit more it can do, which I'll show on the next slide. Um, and we can operate at uh, uh, these things operate directly at VN, which comes up this direction from, from the input and the, the, the input MOSFET that can turn the board off. Um, and so the power comes up and can uh, drive this thing at six amps per DRV. So that's one amp per channel. Um, and uh, there are um, JSTZH uh, connectors, which are uh, go all the way through the board and are soldered on the other side. So they're PTH connectors, so and they're shrouded for for, uh, uh, for protection. So they're very durable connectors that we're using across the board. All the dark blue connectors are uh, JSTZH. Um, so the um, the DRV8912 can operate in three separate modes. The first is independent mode, which uh, logically you just hook up one motor to each pair of, uh, of, of outputs from the DRV. And so you can actually hook up six motors. You only have four independent PWMs. And so you can operate any four of them. And at any moment you can select which four. Uh, it can be operated independently um, at whatever duty cycle you want. Uh, and then the other two um, are slaved. They can operate in full break, full coast, um, full forward or full reverse, um, or they can duplicate PWM frequency and duty cycle of one of the independent motors. Um, and so this is actually sufficient flexibility in most applications, which um, have some diversity of, uh, of, of power um, that you don't usually need to drive uh, all six independently at the same time. Uh, and so this can um, be put to uh, good effect. But wait, there's more. Uh, next thing that you can do um, is you can gang together the outputs because remember the DRV generates the PWMs itself. And so we can set up some outputs to get the signal from one PWM synchronized uh, appropriately. And so in software, we can set things up so we can drive one motor at four amp and one motor at two amps as shown here or these other configurations, one six amp motor, two motors at three amps, et cetera. Um, but wait, there's more. Um, there is also this cool mode so called sequential mode, which allows you to, if you have the voltage which is low enough that it can't drive two motors in series because uh, it doesn't overcome stall torque, then you can hook up this really cool sequential mode where you can uh, set out three, six, nine, and 12 as high impedance inputs. Then you can drive the motor indicated in, in green 
for a while, then you can switch which ones you set as high impedance inputs, and then you can drive those four motors for a while, then you can drive those four motors for a while, and you can cycle back and forth. Um, and so you can drive a remarkable um, 12 motors per DRV or 24 motors total with a single, uh, single beret, which is pretty cool. Okay, moving forward to servos and ESCs, um, we can drive up to 10 servos or ESCs, a variety of sizes, up to three amps each, uh, again, as, assuming some um, signal diversity. So the connectors for servos are the standard um, signal uh, power and ground connection. And again, we can select either VS1 or VN for a signal header A. Um, and uh, the um, default mode, of course, is um, uh, providing signals which provide PWMs for driving standard servos and ESCs, um, but there are other modes as well. You can drive a couple of I2C channels, you can set up some extra encoder channels um, on these, uh, these signal pins if you don't have uh, sufficient uh, um, functionality elsewhere on the board. Um, and uh, there are seven uh, quadrature encoders. So these E connectors are normally set up uh, for quadrature encoders together with power and ground. So it's convenient to just stick a JST in there and uh, pull the, uh, the power ground and the, the, the signals out to, uh, uh, to drive encoders. These are again driving uh, without loading the main arm core. Um, so all of the counting is done in little timer units on the STM. Um, and of course, in uh, default mode, it's set up for quadrature encoder counting. But there are alternative modes that you can set up, uh, again, another I2C channel or a UART channel or a low power UART channel um, or PWMs to drive additional servos and ESCs. And so um, quite some flexibility of how you can uh, set the system together. There's an analog header um, that has two 12-bit uh, digital to analog converters. Spare op amp is already wired up. There are two um, analog to digital converters. Um, and so you can hook this up to some system and take its Bode plot. It's got a, a full uh, DAC ADC system uh, already hooked up. Uh, it does uh, voltage monitoring of the adjustable voltages that's developed on the board, uh, mo monitors the individual cell voltages of the battery. Um, there's a state of charge indicator. We do not do battery charging on this board. So we made a different decision here than we did on the BeagleBone Blue. Um, if we're driving higher power motors, we recommend a high quality battery charger. Uh, and it was too much to ask to, uh, to find the real estate to put that on the board. So we made the decision early on to remove the battery charger from the board. You got to plug into the wall anyway. You might as well have the little bit of electronics to, uh, uh, to do the, the battery charging um, uh, when you're plugging in to your uh, external power source. Uh, to, to charge the battery. Um, and so by removing that, we freed up a lot of space for other stuff on the board. Um, our analog system has a very flexible uh, second order low pass filter, um, which has a uh, software tunable gain and a software tunable um, second order low pass filter, a solid key low pass filter right here. Um, and the stuff in red uh, is actually on the STM32 itself uh, and the components in black um, are on the beret. Um, and uh, the adjustable resistors um, shown allow you to uh, adjust the gain on the analog system between a factor of one and 4,000 and allow you to adjust to the, um, the cutoff frequency of the second order filter uh, between uh, frequencies of 34 to 3,400 Hertz. We have best in class sensors for attitude estimation, uh, a three axis magnetometer, a barometer, um, and an IMU. Um, and uh, there is a uh, uh, 32 kilohertz MEMS oscillator uh, that hooks both to the STM32 and the real-time clock there and to um, the, uh, uh, the IMU uh, in order to uh, keep everything accurately in sync. Um, and um, the operational modes of these sensors, by default, um, they perform fixed rate measurements and they give a data-ready signal every time you get a fresh uh, signal um, from, from each of these things, and that can be used in an, as an interrupt um, in your uh, state estimation algorithm uh, in order to do accurate state estimation. Um, but you can also um, set up flags for background monitoring, um, and you can uh, put the whole system in a low power state, um, just uh, sipping off of a, uh, of a coin cell. Uh, and then when uh, there's a, a, a tap or a, a magnetic field or a, a shake um, or a change in altitude, um, then uh, you can uh, wake up the board through its power MOSFET um, to, uh, to then wake up and uh, actuate something, open the window or whatever you need to do. 
Um, so just a really quick uh, survey of the connectors. So the dark blue connectors are JSTZH um, and they hook up to most of the things, including uh, the CAN FD and RS-45 uh, transceivers on the board. Uh, the, the notion is that um, if you're using um, these, uh, these long distance communication channels, you will have a little jumper from these little JSTs to an environmental housing a uh, short distance away. And then you'll have the ruggedized twisted pair to take it from there uh, to a quarter mile away to the barn or something. Uh, and, uh, and that will connect to the housing. Um, and then uh, this connector is only for the, the, the last um, few centimeters uh, to, to connect from, from, from the housing to the, uh, to the board itself. Um, and uh, so we also have these uh, shield uh, connectors um, that expand the functionality of the board. Um, and uh, so there's uh, uh, two digital headers that have SPI and I2C and power pins um, and an analog header that has all the analog functionality and handle up to three amps per pin. Um, the signal headers, standard uh, connectors for uh, servos and ESCs can handle up to three amps per pin. Um, and the standard JSTXH uh, connector for uh, monitoring the voltage of each cell of a LiPo battery. Um, and uh, of course, a uh, USB micro B input for, uh, for programming the microcontroller. Okay, so our shields are connected normally on these uh, Arduino-like um, one by nine, 0 0.1 inch uh, pins. Um, and uh, there's, uh, they can optionally connect also to the signal header. So we provide a lot of power uh, on these last two rows of the signal header and five extra digital signals here. Um, and so we can connect, say, to the first row. All of these pins are aligned on a 0 0.1 inch grid, so it's really easy to attach to them. Um, and uh, so these shields provide us extra, extra functionality. Um, and so they can be of a regular size, um, which is uh, one by three uh, by 0 0.9 inches. Um, can be slightly longer, so they can pick up just the signals from signal header A, um, or they can be even larger to connect uh, to the power and ground rows of signal header A, so you can drive something pretty substantial um, on uh, this beret shield. Um, and you can also, um, if you want, cover up a little bit of the functionality over here uh, in order to get more surface area on your beret shield if you need it, and it's high enough that you can actually sneak a wire underneath it and connect into those connectors, actually. Um, and so as an example, here is our low current uh, brushless DC beret shield. Uh, we actually have six um, uh, connectors on there um, for, uh, for, for six uh, small brushless DC motors running it up to 24 volts and two amps. Beret shields come in three types. Prototyping beret shields just have an array of pre-drilled holes on a 0.1 inch grid, um, and they can either be non-plated to provide a mechanical backing of POTS uh, printed circuit boards, or they can be plated. Um, for rapid development and testing of your own designs. You can put little uh, uh, components down there um, on a standard 0 0.1 inch grid. Um, the second type is prefabricated. So we're going to design a bunch um, and uh, hopefully others will as well. We'll support a web page where um, the open hardware designs can be uh, uh, uploaded and shared and community supported. So they provide you with additional functionality that didn't make it onto the beret itself. So for instance, first thing many people are going to need is brushless DC motor drivers. Um, and so we picked up some uh, some components again from, from TI that are really good for that. There it is mounted on a Raspberry Beret. Um, and there it is stacked. And so these are stackable shields. And, uh, and so you can identify which one's which with the solder jumper. You can actually communicate to uh, three of these boards at the same time uh, and not get your signals crossed, um, which, is, uh, which is a nice feature. A uh, little OLED display, we can, uh, we can fit that uh, quite compactly into this, uh, uh, this platform and uh, put that on, onto, uh, onto a board, makes for uh, a uh, output of uh, quite a bit of uh, useful information of, of what the board is doing, um, et cetera. There are a whole lot of other boards that we're designing as well um, that are summarized in the data sheet, which I'll give you a link to at the end of the talk. Um, and so the third type of Bray shield um, are custom Bray shields. You can modify directly the open hardware circuits designs of the 
prefabricated uh, beret shields and build your own um, that have exactly the functionality you need. And that facilitates dense and secure arrangement of the user's choice uh, of components for long-term use, much better than using those white breadboards where wires always pull out. So highly encourage that. A few other random features, of course, there's IR encoding. There's a rechargeable coin cell that you can optionally put on the back. There's a uh, additional flash memory that can be soldered on. It's just got eight pins. You can actually solder on your own uh, flash memory. Um, power is selectable on many of our pins. And so on the back side, we have um, backside solder jumpers built right around the pins, which is a pretty cool way to uh, allow this device to be powered by either 3.3 or 5 volts. There is some ESD production uh, on some lines as specified here, but not on others. You can try this board. Thank you. The uh, data sheet for this board is being developed as chapter five of a new book that we're writing, uh, and you can pick that up right here.